Hello, welcome back to our video series on healthcare information technology. We will continue our course with this video on chapter number seven, basic healthcare information security. Uh, some objectives for this chapter, define information security, list and describe the different elements of physical security, explain how computer security can protect data, and describe different types of data backups. Now the need for security is a significant aspect of our life today. This includes uh, personal physical security, and the security of our information. This also includes defending against information attacks. And this is partic particularly important in the healthcare industry because you're dealing with such private uh, personal information. And HIPAA provides for significant penalties for unauthorized disclosure of that protected patient information. So what is information security? This actually describes the task of securing information that is in a digital format. And there are some protection goals when it comes to information security, such as uh, confidentiality, where only authorized parties can access uh, information. It includes integrity, which ensures the information is correct about that patient. It also includes availability. This is where the data is accessible to authorized users only. Now, these goals apply to devices that store and manipulate and transmit the information about the patient. And information security is achieved through various products, people, and procedures. Right, in this image, we have, a, we have the information security components. So here in the middle, we have you know, integrity, confidentiality, availability of the information, various hardware and software, and communications in general. And the first layer of security is the physical security, the actual products, you know, the desktops, the servers. The next layer of security beyond that would be the people involved, you know, the personnel security. And the layer beyond that would be procedures, the organizational security. Now, on this table, we have a description of the various layers of security and what that would in entail. For products, these are what will form the physical security around data. It could be as something as simple as a door lock you know, in a in the server room, for example. People, this includes the people who are responsible for implementing and the and proper use of security products used to protect that data. And then procedures, these are the plans and the policies that are established by the organization to ensure that the people correctly use those products. Right, first, we'll start with physical security. Now, this involves securing devices so unauthorized users can't access them. And physical access security would include you know, securing the environment, uh, the office hardware, and the equipment. And also would include regulating access to that equipment. Right, we're talking about the uh, physical environment. Securing the surrounding environment is the first step in physical security. Now, in the past, this was done by the use of security guards. We moved on to uh, security technology tools including lighting and fencing, uh, video surveillance, uh, fire suppression equipment, backup power generators, and HVAC systems. The security perimeter can include a barrier such as fencing around a physical uh, facility, and it often consists of a fence together with other deterrents. When it comes to security lighting, these can be installed on poles or building exteriors or canopies or landscaping around a facility. On this table, we have some examples of uh, fencing deterrents that could be used, whether it be anti-climbing paint, an anti-climb collar, a roller barrier, or rotating spikes. And all of these are going to be additional deterrents on top of just the traditional fencing that will help limit access of any unauthorized people into a facility. Right, when it comes to video surveillance of the environment, this is where you're able to use video cameras to monitor an activity. A good example of this would be uh, closed circuit television, or CCTV. This is where you use a video camera to transmit a signal to a specific set of receivers. And these cameras that are used can be either uh, fixed or be able to move. And these are commonly used in military installations, banks, uh, casinos, airports, uh, fire suppression uh, systems. Of course, fire will represent a constant threat to people and to property and, of course, to data. And there are four required uh, components for fire to occur. You need fuel, you need oxygen, you need heat, and then a chemical reaction. If any one of these four are not there, then the, then the fire can't start. Okay, on this table, we have uh, the variety of, of different classes of fires, or fire types. So in this column, we have a different class of fires, uh, the type of fire that would be an example of that class, the materials that would be combustible, how you would extinguish that, and then different uh, fire extinguisher that you would use. Not all fires are going to be the same. Not all fire extinguishers are going to be the same. Depending on what is burning, what the fuel source is, that will determine how you extinguish it and what type of extinguisher to use. If you use the wrong kind, you could easily make the fire a lot worse. For example, uh, common combustibles would be a class A fire, such as paper, wood, textiles, and so on. 
And this is what you would normally use just water or foam or any other dry chemical to put that fire out. A class B fire would be uh, combustible liquids such as oils or solvents or paints or grease. And for this you would need a, a foam or a dry chemical or, or carbon dioxide a way to extinguish the fire. This is why you, or you should never put water on a grease fire. If you do so, you are making it a lot worse because all you're doing is expanding the fire. A class C fire would be an electrical fire where you have live or energized electrical wires or equipment no catching fire. Class D would be combustible metals such as magnesium, potassium, titanium. And class K would be uh, cooking oils such as uh, vegetable oils, animal oils, or fats in cooking appliances. When it comes to fire suppression systems, there are different kinds. You can have a standard water sprinkler system. You can have a dry chemical system. Or you can have a clean agent system. Uh, power generators. You can always use a backup generator in the event of a, a loss of power uh, to protect the data. And these can be uh, powered by a diesel engine or natural gas or even propane. The HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. These are the systems that will control and maintain uh, temperature and humidity levels in the facility. And these can reduce the electrostatic charge that can damage equipment. And this is very related to uh, the next item listed, data closets. These are specific rooms that are designed uh, to house uh, computer systems and network equipment. And these kinds of rooms tend to, or tend to have very special cooling requirements. You know, a room like this that houses a standard uh, network or several uh, computer servers will get very, very warm very, very quickly. So if these rooms aren't cooled, then these servers will overheat and then shut down. So you have a, a high risk of losing data. Uh, some office hardware that could be used. A privacy screen. This is a freestanding panel uh, to divide a work area. And this can also refer to a, a cover over a computer monitor that will greatly narrow the viewing angle so people walking by couldn't see what you're working on. You can also use uh, residential hardware door locks. This could be you know, a keyed entry lock or a privacy lock, a patio lock, a passage lock. And all these, even though they add another layer of security, these are often minimal security enhancements. See, a lock that's commonly used in commercial buildings is a deadbolt lock, where you have a solid bar that extends into the door frame itself. These offer more security than a standard keyed entry. All right, when it comes to equipment for the facility, a network hardware should be located behind a locked door. See, a pretty standard form of equipment that's used is a UPS, uninterruptible power supply. This is a device that will maintain power uh, to the equipment in case there's a, there is an interruption in uh, the main power. These can be either in offline or online mode. In an offline mode, these can quickly begin uh, supplying power when needed. And in an online UPS, these are always running off its battery while the main power runs the battery charger. And these are not affected by any uh, power surges or any dips or sags in voltage. And UPS systems can communicate with a network operating system on a server to ensure orderly uh, shutdowns. And when it comes to uh, healthcare facilities in particular, it is important to secure office imaging equipment because attackers could easily access images in digital memory. All right, now we'll talk about regulating access. One of the kinds of locking systems we talked about earlier were the, the keyed entry locks. And there are some disadvantages to using uh, keys to access a secured area. The keys have to be managed, which means the keys can be easily lost or stolen or duplicated when they shouldn't be. And then the keys themselves need to be securely stored when not being used. So an alternative to using a key lock system is a cipher lock system. And this is a, a push button code where you enter a series of numbers in order to open a door. You can also use different kinds of uh, physical tokens you know, to regulate access, such as an ID badge containing you know, the person's photograph, ID badge that has a barcode you know, that is swiped in order to open uh, the door, an ID badge that's read by a proximity reader. You can have an RFID tag that's read by a proximity reader. You can also use a electronic uh, key fob, which is a keyless entry like you would use on a car. Another way to regulate access is using biometrics. And this is using a person's unique physical characteristics to authenticate who they are, such as a retinal scanner or an example listed here, a fingerprint scanner. In this image, we have examples of a cipher lock and also an RFID tag. Okay, image here on the left would be a cipher lock, where instead of using a regular key that would you know, go in here to open a door, you would punch in a series of numbers in order to unlock the door. And here the RFID tag, that's red and be able to grant access. Now when it comes to the finger, or fingerprint scanners, there are two kinds, either static or dynamic. In a static scanner, the user will place their entire finger on the scanner window. And in a dynamic scanner, the person will slide their finger across a reader, like how you would use a smartphone, for example. 
But there are some big disadvantages to using uh, biometrics. The first is the cost. This kind of technology and equipment is not cheap. And it's not 100% accurate either. All right, next we'll talk about computer security. And this is providing security for data that's stored on a computer. And this is a critical function for a healthcare IT professional. And the various aspects of uh, computer security, including password security, computer permissions, and defending against common security risk. All right, first kind we'll talk about are passwords. This is a secret combination of letters and numbers and characters that only the user should know. And this is the most common type of authentication that's used today. And it usually offers only weak protection. There are some very big weaknesses when it comes to using passwords. Because you are relying on that person's memory. If they can't recall their password, then they can't access the computer to do their work. When passwords get long and complex, they tend to be difficult to remember. Especially when you start using a series of capital letters, and lowercase letters, and special characters. It's very easy to confuse which one was capitalized or what special character was used. Another weakness is users must recall passwords for different accounts. You may have one password to access, say, the hospital main network, but another password for your work email, for example. All right, when it comes to password defenses, it's important to create and manage a strong password. In creating a strong password, this will usually consist of a root word and a suffix or a prefix. And there are some standard guidelines when it comes to creating a strong password. Uh, for example, do not use dictionary or phonetic words. Do not use personal information, such as your birth date, or your phone number, or your social security number. Uh, do not repeat characters or use a sequence of characters. You shouldn't be using A, B, C, D, E, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 4 E's in a row, or 4 you know, C's in a row. And using longer passwords, you know, 12 characters or more, is a good indicator of a strong password. Another way to make passwords stronger is by using non-keyboard characters. And the way you do this is holding down the Alt key while pressing a number on the keypad, on the keyboard. And for example, if you hold down Alt and the number 3, you get a filled-in heart symbol. If you hold in Alt and the number 4, you get a filled-in uh, diamond symbol, like the diamond you would find on a deck of cards. Those characters aren't found on a standard keyboard. You have to know what keys to press at the same time to create that character. And a good password management, important to change passwords frequently. Uh, do not reuse older passwords. You don't want to recycle the same password over and over and over again. And never write a password down. Now in this image, we have an example of, of a Windows character map. So in addition to using the center letters that you would use, you know, using special characters like these could make a password more difficult to hack and make it much make it much stronger. Some other guidelines that go by for good password management. Have a unique password for each account. You can set up a temporary password for when another user needs to needs to access your account. Do not allow a computer to automatically sign in or store a password so that a login is unnecessary. Do not enter passwords on a public computer and never share a password with another person. Now there are some password supplements that could be used. You can have an autocomplete password that's used in most modern web browsers. And these will store encrypted passwords in a Microsoft Windows registry. You can also use password management applications. And this is basically the digital equivalent of a sticky note that you would put on your monitor. On this table, we have a summary of some password management applications, including an installed application, a portable application, and internet storage. And then some advantages or disadvantages of each. For example, an installed application. This is installed as a program on a local computer. Obviously, a big advantage allows the user to access passwords without having to memorize each one. But a big disadvantage is it must be installed on every computer used. See, a portable application is a standalone application that's carried on a portable USB uh, flash drive. The advantage for this, the user is not limited to computers that only have that application uh, pre-installed with the vault file. But a big disadvantage is that user must always have that flash drive with them that contains that application. And internet storage is where we have an application that is stored online. Big advantage here, you can access a program from any computer, but a big disadvantage is uh, storing passwords online can easily expose them to attacks and being hacked. All right, now we'll talk about uh, permissions. And there are multiple means of permissions. You have identification. An example would be a delivery person showing you their ID badge. Authentication is the process of checking the information. Then you have authorization, you know, granting permission to take action. And when it comes to setting up uh, permissions, there are different types of access permissions available depending on that person's role in the facility. They may be able to you know, just read information or write information or modify or execute or have full control. 
So it just depends on that person's role in the facility. And then access control list defines who is allowed to access what file or what object. And the good standard to go by is the person should be allowed the least privilege, which, which means you're allocating the minimum amount of privileges needed to perform that person's job. All right, in this image here, we have an example of the Windows permission uh, security tab. And you can see here, either be full control or modify, read and execute, or just read or just write. And for this person, all of these are checked. So this person would be able to do all of these tasks. So again, it just goes back to what that person's role is and should they be able to have full access or not. All right, now we'll talk about some common security risk. Malware this is software that enters a computer system without the user's knowledge or without their consent. And so will often perform an unwanted or a harmful action. And some examples of uh, malware, uh, viruses, uh, worms, and spyware. All right, to distinguish between those three, a virus, this is a computer code that reproduces itself on the same computer. A worm, this is a malicious program that's designed to take advantage of some vulnerability in an application or within an operating system. And this uses a network to send copies of itself to other network devices. And then spyware, this is software that, that gathers information on users without their consent. On right, this table, we have some examples of technologies that are used by spyware. Automatic download software. This is used to download and install software without the user's uh, interaction at all. And the impact of this technology is it could be used to install unauthorized applications. Uh, passive tracking technology used to gather information about the user's activities without installing any software. And this could be used to collect private information, such as uh, websites that that person has visited. System modifying software. This will modify uh, user configurations, such as you know, the browser homepage or the main search page that they use. So the impact here is making changes to settings that the user did not authorize. And uh, tracking software is used to monitor uh, user behavior and to gather information about that user, sometimes including uh, personal information. And the impact here, you know, collecting personal information could easily be stolen or shared with other people, which could result in identity theft and fraud. And some other uh, common security risk, uh, social engineering. This is the means of gathering information for an attack by relying on weaknesses of individuals. And this often involves a clever manipulation of human nature to persuade a victim to provide information or to take action. Uh, phishing. This is sending a deceptive email that claims to be from a legitimate person or a legitimate enterprise. And the goal is to, here is to trick the user into surrendering private information. A key defense against phishing is providing security awareness and training to users. Being able to recognize what emails are legitimate, what emails are not legitimate. Uh, spamming. An unsolicited email, very commonly used for advertising purposes or distributing uh, malware. The profit for people who send these spam emails can be substantial. And email uh, spam filters attempt to block spam before it even reaches uh, the main inbox of that user. All right, now we'll talk about uh, data backups. This is copying digital information to a different medium. And this will be stored separately so it can be used in the case there is a disaster and the main source of the data gets uh, lost or damaged. And when it comes to a disaster recovery plan, it should answer five basic questions. What information should be backed up? How often should it be backed up? What media should be used? Where should the backup be stored? And what hardware or software should be used? All right, the archive bit, this is used to flag which files need, need to be backed up. There are different kinds of backups. It can be a, a full or a daily backup, a differential backup, or an incremental backup. And the data backups should be stored at a separate location. This will reduce the risk of data being lost in case there is a disaster. All right, this table, we have a summary of the different kinds of uh, data backups and how they may be used. A full or daily backup. Now, this is the starting point for all backups. And just like the name implies, you're backing up everything or backing up everything every single day. A differential backup. This backs up only the data that has been changed since the last full backup. Then you can have an incremental backup. And this will back up any data that has changed since the last full backup or since the last incremental backup. Okay, that brings us to the end of this chapter, chapter number seven. A quick summary of what we discussed. Uh, information security creates a defense to ward off attacks designed to steal information. There are three types of protections, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, securing the devices themselves is an important aspect to information security. Uh, backup generators can be used to provide power in the event of a power loss. Sensitive information should be placed in a room secured by a deadbolt lock. Various types of ID badges can be used to control access to a secured area. 
Biometrics uses human physical characteristics to, to provide authentication. Passwords provide a weak degree of protection. Malware is unwanted software that is often harmful. Different types of data backups include full, differential, and incremental. This brings us to the end of chapter number 7. We will conclude our video series on healthcare information technology with our next video on chapter number 8, Advanced Healthcare Information Security.